a warm welcome to um, all of you. Um, uh, I am Kumar Narayanan uh, from India. I am the chair of the APHRS Young EP Subcommittee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this Young EP webinar, uh, which we have been conducting uh, from the past one year. The idea of these webinars is uh, basically to provide a case-based learning, which uh, we thought was a more effective format uh, of imbibing important principles in EP and device uh, therapy as compared to didactic lectures. So uh, basically we are going to have uh, three presenters uh, today who are going to take us through some interesting cases. And uh, the uh, idea is that we would be able to uh, learn some good concepts in EP and device through these uh, cases. And so we have three very interesting presentations uh, lined up today by young EP presenters uh, from three different uh, countries, France, Singapore, and uh, India. And to guide us through these uh, proceedings, uh, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, two senior uh, eminent uh, faculty from the APHRS region. So I just would like to uh, briefly introduce our eminent chairpersons and welcome them. First, we have with us uh, Professor Xian Chen, uh, a very uh, senior and well-known uh, EP uh, all over the world. He's the superintendent of the Taichung Veterans General Hospital in Taipei, Taiwan. He's the past president of the APHRS and also one of the editors in chief, uh, the editor in chief of the Journal of uh, Arrhythmia. So we are very privileged to have you, sir, and uh, we welcome you warmly. And uh, next, we also have uh, with us Professor Anil Saxena from India. He is the immediate past president of the Indian Heart Rhythm Society. He is the director of cardiac pacing and EP at the Fortis Escorts Heart Institute in New Delhi, India. He is the chief editor of the APHRS newsletter and also associate editor of the Pace Journal. Uh, again, uh, it's our um, uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome you, sir, to this uh, webinar. Uh, now I hand over the proceedings to the chairpersons uh, so that they can introduce uh, each speaker and then the speakers will go ahead with their uh, case presentations. Over to you, Professor Saxena and Professor Chen. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. please go ahead and so that you can uh, uh, briefly uh, introduce the speaker and then they can go ahead with their presentations. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed a pleasure and uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar, for introduction. Uh, I welcome all the delegates to this uh, excellent initiative of APHRS. And I must welcome my co-chair, Professor Chen. Hello. The first speaker will be uh, Dr. Victor Waldman. Uh, he will present a case of uh, congenital heart disease ablation. A few cases. Dr. Victor, please. Thank you for, for the, this invitation and thank you for the introduction. I will uh, share my screen. So I'm Victor Waldman. I work in uh, France, Paris. Um, I uh, work at the European Georges Pompidou Hospital in uh, adult congenital heart disease and also in a uh, pediatric EP at the uh, Necker Hospital. I'm going to uh, present to you a few cases of catheter ablation in congenital heart disease. And I will uh, um, get straight to the point um, because I've, I have uh, three different cases in, uh, to present to you. The first one is a case of a man, 48 years old, who had a mustard surgery at the age of two. Just a quick rem reminder on the mustard surgery. Uh, it was performed uh, in patients with uh, transposition of the great arteries. Nowadays, uh, most often surgeons uh, perform an arterial switch to reconnect the artery on the left ventricle and the uh, pulmonary artery on the uh, right ventricle. But a few decades ago, it wasn't an option. Uh, so a surgeon um, created baffle to, re to redirect the blood flow to the uh, vena cava, to the um, right ventricle under the aorta, as you can see uh, here. And so this patient complained uh, of dyspnea for one week. Uh, and here is his uh, ECG at admission. 
you can see a fast atrial activity uh, just here. And so we decided to perform an ablation in, uh, in these patients. We uh, always uh, perform a CT scan before uh, uh, that, that kind of ablation for several reasons. The first one is to completely uh, understand the anatomic specificities uh, of the patient and also to rule out any uh, vascular occlusion or vascular anomaly uh, that can be associated um, in, uh, in those congenital patients. Here is his scanner. You can see in blue the mustard baffle, which is uh, surrounded by the um, pulmonary venous atrium in red. Most of the, of the time in patients with mustard, you have to perform a transbaffle puncture during the procedure. And so we, start, um, we started by performing uh, electroanatomical reconstruction of the baffle, as you can see in gray, with a pantare catheter. To be able to merge this reconstruction with the CT scan uh, that you can see in purple, to uh, identify the best site for the transbaffle puncture. And then when we uh, identified the best sites, we uh, put our um, transeptal needle just close to the ablation catheter, and we are able to perform the uh, transbaffle puncture. We can also connect the transeptal needle directly to the cartosystem system to um, visual visualize it and to perform the transbaffle puncture uh, without any fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy use. And in some patients, but it's relatively rare with a uh, patient with mustard surgery, we uh, have to apply radio frequency uh, energy directly on the uh, needle, but it's, it's quite rare in uh, those patients. And after we uh, perform the transeptal puncture just uh, without fluoroscopy use, as you can see. Here is the B atrial activation map in this patient. You can see that the circuit was turning around the tri tricuspid valve. But the specific thing is that uh, in those patients with uh, atrial switch, so mustard or staining surgery, the cavotricuspid isthmus is actually splitted in two by the baffle that you can see here. And so you have to perform radio frequency application on both sides of the baffle. Here on the uh, largest part between the tricuspid annulus and the baffle, but also on the other side, uh, on the inferior vena cava side. Here, a short video of a similar patient, but in, in a patient with a staining surgery, so uh, quite similar, but with a, a native atrial tissue and not a prosthetic material. We started by uh, reconstructing the um, Staining. As you can see, a sig significant part of the cycle lens was missing. And so we decided to perform the puncture. We carefully uh, merged the uh, reconstruction with the CT scan. We then identified the best sites for puncture here. and we perform the transeptal puncture, just as uh, I described to you. Then we um, perform the uh, activation map of the other atrium. And as in the first patient, it was also a peritricuspid flutter and is by far the, the most common circuit in those patients. We are able to stop the flutter here uh, in the pulmonary venous atrium, as you can see. But we had also to perform a uh, radio frequency application on the other side to complete the line and to be able to demonstrate a complete block by pacing on both sides of the line and uh, doing an activation map. Here is a second case, a case of a woman, 46 years old, with tricuspid atresia, who had an extra cardiac fontan. So a tube that connected the inferior vena cava with the pulmonary artery. She uh, had palpitation for a few weeks and here is uh, her ECG. You can easily diagnose an atrial flutter. And the funny thing is uh, that the ECG pattern looks like a typical flutter. Uh, despite uh, this patient had uh, tricuspid atresia, so no uh, 
trike speed handlers. Uh, so she was referred for ablation. We once again performed a CT scan before the ablation uh, to be sure that the extra cardiac tube that you can see on the left was stuck to the heart. And then we performed the trans tube puncture uh, with the same approach that I described to you. But this time in patients with Gore-Tex tube, we have most of the time to perform a balloon expansion to be able to cross the tube um, with the sheath. And on the right, um, here is the, um, the activation map of the flutter. And we um, finally identified a small scar area in gray here, just close to the heat signal, uh, which was probably re related to the atletic tracker speed analysis. Um, and the circuit was turning around this atletic tracker speed analysis. So uh, even if uh, this patient had tracker speed uh, atresia, the uh, flutter was kind of a typical flutter around this uh, atletic tracker speed um, analysis. And we terminated the flutter by performing an ablation line between the scar area and the point where the inferior uh, vena cava was overseen during the surgery. And a few publications demonstrated that uh, most of the time uh, in patients with extra cardiac tube, um, this circuit is the most frequent between the annulus and the uh, point where the inferior vena cava was overseen. It's our approach but in some other centers where remote magnetic navigation systems are available, uh, some operators don't perform transtube approach, but uh, a retrograde aortic approach because of the greater maneuverability of the catheter with two big magnets that uh, create uh, a magnetic field um, and you can uh, direct very uh, easily your, your, your catheter, just uh, as you can see on the, on the video and very easily remotely with a mouse, joy by, joy by selecting uh, the direction of the magnetic field by, uh, with the arrow that you can see here, and uh, pushing or withdrawing the catheter just with the mouse. Here, another video in another patient with uh, Fontan surgery, but this time with, the, with an intra-atrial lateral tunnel. So it's not an extra cardiac tube, Excuse me. It's not an extra an extra cardiac tube, but um, the inferior vena cava is connected to the pulmonary pulmonary artery, but by a tube within the atrium, and a part of the tube is uh, the native uh, atrium. So sometimes you can have a circuit which is confined in this tube, okay, and you do not uh, do not have to perform a trans tube puncture. So we started by uh, performing an actual uh, activation map of uh, the intra-atrial lateral tunnel. But once again, a significant part of the cycle length was missing. So we carefully reconstructed the anatomy to merge it with the CT scan. We once again uh, identified the best site for trans uh, tunnel puncture. We perform the puncture uh, by putting our transeptal needle just close to the ablation catheter. And then we uh, perform the uh, activation map of the other atrium. And once again, it was kind of a typical flutter, even though um, the uh, cabotric speed isthmus was split into, uh, not by uh, the mustard baffle this time, but, but by, by the uh, lateral tunnel. So we applied radio frequency uh, application uh, on the cabotric speed isthmus. It wasn't so simple as you can see with a lot of application, but we were able to stop it just here. And we completed the line on the other side, as you can see here. And after we demonstrated a complete block by pacing on both sides. And the last case that I wanted to share with you is a case of a, a, a 30 years old man with a tetralogy of fallow who had an indication for pulmonary valve replacement because of severe pulmonary regurgitation and who had paroxysmal flutter and non-sustained VT. In patients with tetralogy of fallow, as in most congenital patients, the most frequent circuit in the uh, atrium is a peri flutter. 
and uh, this was the first arrhythmia that we uh, induced. But um, incisional flutter are also uh, relatively frequent, in particular frequent around the uh, uh, iatriotomy scar. And the, the thing that is very, really important in those patients is to carefully map the phrenic nerve projections by pacing with a high uh, output. Uh, and in this patient, we also induce so, uh, another uh, flutter around this atriotomy scar on the lateral wall of the right atrium. And we uh, perform this line um, uh, carefully avoiding the phrenic nerve to uh, avoid any phrenic nerve injury. But those patients are also exposed to a significant risk of ventricular arrhythmias. So uh, we uh, perform a um, voltage map of the right ventricle. And you see the typical uh, scar that we identified in fallow patients. So the infundibular scar and the ventricular septal defect closure patch here. Um, most of the time, ventricular tachycardia involve four uh, different anatomical isthmuses, and in particular, the number three, which is involved in most uh, circuits between the pulmonary valve and the uh, VASD patch. In these patients, we uh, induce two different tachycardia. This one. Tachycardia, the tachycardia was very fast, so we uh, only... Uh, uh, had the time to perform a limited activation map, but the circuit was turning around the pulmonary valve. It was finally overdrived due to instability. We induced then a second tachycardia, but also turn, turned around the, the pulmonary valve, but in the other side, with also a loop just here. So we decided to perform uh, an ablation line in the common isthmus between the pulmonary valve and then the uh, uh, fr from the pulmonary valve to the tricuspid uh, annulus. We stop the uh, VT and we were then uh, able to demonstrate a complete block in uh, during the activation map. But the last message that I wanted to share with you is that in other patients, and here is uh, the activation map of, of uh, VT in another patients, sometimes you have to uh, go in the aorta. Because in this patient, despite a lot of radio frequency application uh, between the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid, tricuspid inolus, we weren't able to terminate the VT. And so we were only able to terminate the VT during a radio frequency uh, application in the aorta. So in fallow patient, when the block is incomplete or when the VT, we, when you don't succeed uh, in terminating the VT in the right ventricle, it's very important to, uh, to go in the uh, aorta. It's all for me. Uh, once again, thank you for this invitation and, and your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Victor. Uh, can you unshare your uh, slides? Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was an excellent presentation and wonderful cases. Congratulations. Uh, Professor Chen, would you like to uh, ask any question? There's one question in the chat box that do you always uh, use transesophageal echo or eye? So what, what is your preferred method to guide the punctures? Uh, in our team, we almost never use uh, echocardiographic guidance for those cases. It, it, that's why we uh, very carefully reconstruct the anatomy and that's why we, we take time to, to merge the, the, the images with the CT scan. And we perform this uh, puncture by putting our transeptal needle just close to the ablation catheter and we don't need uh, an echocardiographic guidance. We can also okay. connect the transeptal needle or the guider wire on the CATO system to visualize, visualize it. And we use uh, echocardiographic guidance uh, only uh, in when we uh, don't succeed uh, with this uh, approach. Great uh, case, uh, cases, Victor, and uh, <clears throat> really um, good to see your beautiful maps uh, in all of these cases which makes it look so simple uh, at the end. But uh, one more question which I wanted to ask you, maybe at a little more basic level is, you, you did show the ECGs of the flutter. 
Uh, do you think some guidance can be obtained as to the localization by the ECG in such congenital cases, or it's too complex for to be guided by the ECG? Uh, thanks, Kumar. It, of course, it depends of uh, of the uh, congenital on, on the underlying congenital heart disease. Uh, I would say um, when the when the pa ECG pattern looks like a, a typical flutter, most of the time it will be a typical flutter. But sometimes, even with a, a typical flutter pattern, you can also have a double loop uh, circuit, uh, in particular in patients with a lateral uh, scar. But when the ECG pattern um, doesn't look like a, a typical, I don't take too much time to uh, to uh, imagine where the flutter can be. Uh, I, I think uh, you just have to go in and, and to see. Uh, it, it's so complicated and it's so heterogeneous population. So I think it's really complicated. And also the presence of the scar would probably change your usual activation patterns as compared to a normal uh, yeah. heart, I guess. Yes, I agree. Okay. And also, what, what has been your uh, experience with the long-term outlook in such patients? Once you ablate, at what proportion do they recur and what proportion tend to do well mm -hmm. in the long run? We, we have to acknowledge that uh, um, even acute success are very important now. Uh, those kind of patients still uh, experience uh, recurrences during long-term follow-up. And uh, in my experience, uh, at least it depends of the congenital heart disease, but at least 20% of patients had recurrence during the first year. Um, and if you take long-term follow-up, uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, quite more. So a lot of patients need uh, two, maybe sometimes three procedures, in particular in complex uh, defect defects. Professor Chen, your comments? Yes, yes I would like to understand uh, how is the uh, body distribution in a patch around the uh, ventricular septum defect or the atrial septum defect. How is your uh, experience? It is a uh, low voltage or you still see the high voltage in a patch area? Uh, excuse me, I, I didn't... Uh understand the question i'm sorry so basically professor chen wants to know when you have the ventricular septal or the atrial septal patch what kind of voltages do you encounter around that area do you find very low voltages or it's still normal or it's heterogeneous uh -huh. okay thank, thank you for the question. it it depends sometimes you, you you easily identify the 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 atrial or ventricular septal uh, patch okay but it, sometimes you can have also in, in more um, smaller patches, uh, you can also uh, uh, higher degree of uh, endothelialization. And so sometimes you, you are not so able to identify it, in particular in a small VHD patch in, in some pa fallow patients. So you might find almost normal voltages, you mean, in, in such cases? If the v VHD patch is very small, yeah, it, 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 it occurs, yeah. Yeah, I, I I also agree uh, to your uh, to your comment because uh, for example, one patient he had the uh, patch repair maybe ten years ago. Then you will see that some endothelial or uh, some muscle layer extension to the patch, so the voltage in that patch area still is normal. So we, mm. we cannot see any scar just on the patch area. Yeah, it is sometimes really stretch. Okay. Thank you, Professor Jen. So in the interest of time, we can move to the next topic, which is a very exciting uh, topic of left bundle branch pacing. And it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Shanmuga Sundaram. He's a very prominent electrophysiologist working in Madurai, India. He's done a lot of work on left bundle pacing in recent years. So um, uh, Dr. Shanmuga, please. Thank you, sir. Uh... Once again, I'd like to thank uh, APHRS for uh, giving me this opportunity. Let me scan, share my screen. So, I, I mean, in the interest of time, I'll straight away go into the topic. So, 
So for years together, uh, RVFX is the prominent site for uh, pacing the ventricles. But the studies have consistently shown the deleterious effects of RV apical pacing. Since it is a non-physiological activation of the ventricular myocardium, you will have electrical as well as mechanical dyssynchrony of both the ventricles, which will be clinically translated as uh, increase in frequent uh, hospital, hospitalization for heart failure, increase in the incidence of atrial fibrillation, as well as increase in the incidence of mortality. So the quest for alternative uh, pacing site has ultimately resulted in what is known as uh, physiological pacing where uh, you'll be pacing either the his bundle or the left bundle. Let us take a clinical scenario, a 57 years old male who actually presented with a heart failure due to dilated cardiomyopathy and severe elbow dysfunction. This ECG showed a white QRS with the duration of 166 milliseconds with a complete left bundle match block and the coronaries were normal. He had a type 2 diabetes mellitus which was under control and hypertension. So this is a case of a typical a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with the ECG showing a white QRS of an LBBB pattern. Looking to the ECG, we can see prominent notches in the uh, lateral leads, uh, 1, ABL, V5, V6, all these areas have notches with a white QRS more than 130 milliseconds. So this fits into a Strauss criteria of what is known as a typical LBB. This PR is almost full, you can see almost 200 milliseconds of PR interval. So this is this uh, echocardiography at the time of admission. You can see global hypokinesia with the preserved wall thickness, mild pericardial effusion, uh, probably moderate mitral regurgitation. All this related to a typical heart failure symptoms. So what are the options? So obviously, if you have to manage it medically for the stabilization of heart failure, once he's stable and with the history of recurrent heart failure and hospitalization, he needs some sort of a cardiac resynchronization therapy. Till few years back, we have we had only this uh, conventional by pacing with the defibrillator because EF is less than 30 as an only modality of cardiac, cardiac resynchronization therapy. But uh, with the advent of uh, physiological pacing, at least in the last uh, three, four years, we have two other options. One is a his bundle pacing where we'll be directly pacing the his bundle. And the second one is a left bundle pacing where we'll be pacing the deep septum to capture the left bundle. Though his bundle provides a near normal QRS with the, with the most physiological form of activating both the ventricles, there are some limitations which we have to keep in mind before performing his bundle pacing. See, we are aiming for a very narrow target, so it's hardly a 4 plus 2 millimeter in the membrane septum. We can either target above or below the tricuspid valve, but irrespective of the site of target, you are going to have at least 5 to 7 percentage of lead dislodgement in the follow up, and another 10 percentage can have a rising threshold. We can have HL oversensing, ventricular undersensing, premature battery depletion due to high output pacing. So all these things can happen with ACE bundle pacing. Apart from that, there are at least 10 to 20% of the white QRS population where you will not be able to narrow down the QRS. So to overcome the limitations, Dr. Huang has suggested an excellent alternative modality, what is known as a left bundle match pacing. So technically it is defined as capturing the left bundle, either the main trunk per se, or even one of its fascicle, along with the septal myocardium, preferably at a low capture threshold. Not all deep septal pacings are labor branch pacing. It has to satisfy certain criteria to confirm that you've captured the cardiac conduction system. It's essential to confirm that you have captured the cardiac conduction system because that is how you will be able to extract maximum benefit. So the criteria, though not validated, is the most, common, most form, commonly used criteria. The one thing which is very, very important to is to get a QR pattern in lead B1. I must say, at least in 99.99% of the patients, you will be having a QR pattern when you're capturing the left bundle. Apart from that, you have to show one of the other criteria: uh, demonstrate the left bundle potentials, demonstrate a short and constant left ventricular activation time, or demonstrate non-selective to selective capture or non-selective to LV septal capture, or even you can do uh, some program deep septal stimulation to confirm that you've captured the left bundle. So to do physiological pacing, we need to have some sort of radiological fluoroscopic anatomy of the cardiac conduction system, apart from having an EP system back. So till now, we usually place a, a, a hispanic catheter, quadripolar catheter from the groin to guide us a fluoroscopic landmark and an RV catheter to act as a backup pacing. So this is an R over 30 view. This is how we usually visualize the cardiac conduction system in a fluoroscopic view at an R over 30 degree. So this is your hispanic catheter. And we try to map the Hisbal catheter with that quadripal Hisbal region with the quadripal catheter to get a signals like this. So in this particular site, you are getting a very small A, a good H, and a prominent V. 
This means that you are almost into the distal aspect of the ismodal zone. So this is very important to tag the distal aspect of the ismodal zone. And uh, then you can uh, uh, draw an imaginary line connecting the distal end of the ismodal to the RBFX. So what we'll be doing in left bundle branch spacing is to target the initial one and a half centimeter. So you can see the uh, rough uh, pictorial representation of Fede conduction system. This will be the distal is bundle. It divides into left bundle and right bundle at the crux of the atrioventricular septum. And this is a broad left bundle branch fiber, which again divides into small anterior fascicle and a broad posterior fascicle. So right bundle will be in line with the his bundle. So remember, while you are doing a mapping, either for ismal pacing or for left bundle pacing, your catheter, both your pacing catheter as well as the sheath, the pacing lead as well as the sheath, should not come in line with the right bundle. So if you are going to bring your sheath in line with this ismal catheter, it's going to damage this right bundle to produce iatrogenic, iatrogenic RBVV or even iatrogenic CHP in patients with a complete LVV. So you have to try to keep your sheath below the ismal catheter if you, have, if you have a quadripolar catheter from the groin and try to target this initial one and a half centimeter. The gadgets are almost the same of, uh, as of performing the ismal pacing. So we have uh, uh, two important things which we have to have in our kitty while for doing conduction system pacing. One is the sheath. So there are two different sheets available, C315 and C304. C315 will have fixed curvatures, two curvatures, one for facilitating entering into the RV. The another one to face the sheath towards the septum. And the other one is a deflectable catheter. Still, the deflectable catheter is not available in India. We are performing uh, either his or left bundle pacing with this fixed curve catheter and the lead. So this uh, lead is actually, is actually not meant for physiological pacing. It was a side selective pacing lead, which was later adapted for doing conduction system pacing. It's an open helix lead, 4.1 front size. It has an open helix. This is the cathode, which is around 1.8 millimeter and this is the anode and this inter-electrode distance is going to be 9 millimeter. So if you are going to measure it from here, the end of the anode to the tip of the lead, it corresponds to 10.8 millimeters. So this is very important while performing lemon punch pacing because you are going to deploy the lead in the proximal septum deep, just almost reaching the left ventricular subadocardia. So you need to know this knowledge of the numbers so that you'll be able to avoid putting the lead into the left ventricular cavity. So I've told like uh, uh, there is only one available sheet, fixed curve sheet. So you have to assemble the sheet just like uh, doing a, a, a conventional uh, CS pacing. So two extra thoracic punctures, uh, you always prefer extra thoracic punctures. Then we always try to keep this uh, seven French peel away sheet in C2 and then thread the uh, CS, uh, this uh, C315 sheet over it. You can see I'm threading this C315 sheet over it. And once you are entering into the uh, heart, either in the right atrium or right directly into the right ventricle, then you have to do counterclockwise or clockwise movement to reach the target zone. See, if you rotate the sheet in a clockwise manner, so if you are going to rotate it in a clockwise manner, intracardiacally your sheet will face towards the cavity, then you'll be able to freely move the sheet into or out of the ventricle. But once you reach the target zone, give a counterclockwise star so that the sheet will get opposed to the septum. So this is very important to take the sheet either from the right atrium into the right ventricle or from the right ventricular apex towards the target zone. So once the target zone is reached, then you just have to put the lead. Uh, this is an open helix lead. You cannot just put it directly without the sheet. So you have to put it inside the sheet. So once the lead reaches the sheath tip, so you just have to expose the tip of the lead outside the sheet. See, only the tip of the sheath is outside. Tip of the lead is outside the sheet. So only your cathode is just outside the sheath. So we'll be doing a unipolar mapping for analyzing the lead parameter. So once your lead is exposed, like I've taken my sheet here, I've taken my lead here. So you can see I've drawn an imaginary line connecting the distal is to the RV apex, and this is going to be my target zone. So now for deployment of the lead inside the septum, there are two different techniques. So one is as described by Dr. Huang et al, where after placing the lead here, you're going to pace and look for W pattern in lead B1. So once you get a W pattern in lead B1, and a positive QRS complex in lead two. So this is also very important. So a positive QRS complex in lead two, then you start screwing, you turn by turn, and you can monitor the impedance, and you can monitor the change in QRS morphology. See, I'm here, just on the right side of the septum, my impedance is 400 ohms. Once I enter into the mid cavity, like mid septal level, my QRS has come down, the notch has gradually ascended up, it has almost formed an isoelectric line, 
and you can see there is a rise in impedance. But once they reach the left bundle area, you can see this notch gradually ascended it to form a QR pattern or even an RSR pattern. And there is a slight drop in impedance from uh, 940 ohms to 800 ohms. So we usually expect a drop in impedance of close to 100 and 150 ohms. And you have a narrowness of the QRS. So once you reach the target zone, you'll be able to even demonstrate the left bundle potentials in which patients where there is an anti-grade conduction of the left bundle. This is one technique. The another technique which we usually perform is a PVC guided level branch pacing. See what we have observed is while deploying the lead rapidly inside the septum, this lead movement inside the septum usually creates or generates some PVCs. What you actually observed is since once the lead traverses from the right side to the left side of the septum, the PVC's morphology will change gradually from QS pattern on the right side to the QR pattern on the left side of the interventricular septum. So what we usually do is once we observe the QR pattern in the monitor while deploying the lead, we'll, give stop, we'll actually stop rotating, uh, giving further turns and we'll analyze the lead parameter. Like you can see, I've started giving rotations and my PVC, let's see the lead B1, my PVC morphology has changed from QS to RS, RSR pattern. So I've stopped giving rotations here and I started looking for the pacing parameters. And you can see there, here that this last generated PVC morphology, as well as the pace QRS morphology, will have a 12 by 12 match. So this confirms that this area where your lead has reached is actually the left bundle area. You need not have to give further turns and you just stop the procedure here, analyze the lead parameters. You can you'll be able to demonstrate all the classical left bundle branch capture criteria here. Once you, once you confirm that you are getting this sort of PVCs. In fact, you can see the final uh, ECG, which is almost like a normal appearing ECG. So what we did was we actually gave a no name for this PVCs. We gave it as a template beat. Since it is this morphology exactly match, matches this uh, base QRS morphology, and we divided our patients into two groups, one who had this template beats while deployment, and the second group which, who did not have this template beats while deployment. So what we observed was those patients who had template beats, which was roughly 58% of the study population, had lesser fluoroscopic time, had a narrow pace QRS duration, and a shorter peak LVAT. Ultimately, this means that it is actually a relatively simple case with a normal septum, where the lead could easily penetrate into the septum. Another important thing is that since you are able to penetrate the lead easily into the septum, the number of attempts to capture the left bundle or number of attempts uh, to do the procedure will come down. So automatically in the myocardial injury and the subsequent troponin release will be less in patients who had a template with guided left bundle branch basis. So this is very important to observe the PVC morphology while rapidly deploying the lead. So this is how we usually do this rapid lead deployment. So I place the lead in the, in the, in the target zone on the right side of the septum. So once I'm confirming myself that I'm in the right area in an RA view. So there are two important things which I'll be doing. So one is I'll take the fluoro to the LA view so that I'll be able to see the lead movement. And another thing is I prefer to change the gloves to wear a fresh pair of gloves so that my hands will be dry for giving rotation. You can see here, so my, my fluoroscopy is just going into an LA view. And I used to give rapid rotation closer to the sheet with both my fingers with a dry new pair of gloves. So these rapid rotations, in fact, can be seen visually on the fluoroscopic screen as the, as the lead goes into the septum like a trace of a bullet. You can see the lead just reaches the target zone within fraction of seconds. So this is how we usually do a PVC guided Lebanon branch pacing. So once you reach the target zone, you can you'll be able to show all the criteria of this Lebanon branch capture, short and constant peak LVAT, where you can see both at eight volt and two volt, your LVAT is 74 milliseconds. And you can even show this non-selective to selective LB capture, wherein you will be observing the local electrographs from the lead tip. So in case of non-selective capture, you will be a pacing artifact immediately followed by the local ventricular electrogram. And once the output reaches the near threshold value, you'll be able to see a distinct isoelectric interval from the pacing artifact to the local ventricular electrogram. Then you can do a CINE to demonstrate the depth of the lead inside the septum. And this is the final pace QRS. So you can see, apart from a QR pattern in lead V1, Otherwise, it is a normal appearing PVC, QRS. So definitely these sort of patients who have a normalization of the QRS, need not have to have an additional lead in the coronary sinus. We can simply finish off the procedure with a dual chamber pacemaker. Not only in India, this is a universal trend which we observe in even in our international collaborative study where we have gathered all the patients of level branch pacing who had undergone this procedure for as a replacement for a cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, it actually was a multi-center study involving eight centers. So what we could observe was LBBP produces significant reduction in QRS 
in both in patients with an LBBB as well as in non-LBBB, resulting in improvement in NUHA functional class, reduction in LV and diastolic diameter, and improvement in LV ejection fraction. Though patients with both LBBB and non-LBBB responded well, just like any other CRT trials, patients with an LBBB morphology had a better response as compared to those with a non-LBBB morphology. Even in patients with dilated LB, like these patients who had an LB of more than LB dimension of more than 70 millimeter, if it is a typical non-ischemic uh, DCM, definitely you have a normalization of QRS and probably you can use a dual chamber pacemaker for doing a CRT. So not only in LBBB, even in patients with an RBBB, you will be able to do justification by doing a level branch pacing. Only thing is that you'll be able, you'll be leaving a residual incomplete RBBB, but still it is much, much better than a, than a conventional bi device, which is, which is going to produce subthreshold response in patients with an RBB. Not all patients with an LBBB can be corrected by level branch pacing in certain subgroup, probably in five to 10% of the LBB patient. And predominantly in IBCD patients, your level branch pacing is not going to correct the QRS. In those cases, you may ask for the help of the additional CS lead wherein you can optimize the CRT by using both left bundle as well as a CS lead. So like in this patient where the LV industrial diameter was 80 millimeter, the QRS was quite broad. It's almost 220 milliseconds. The left bundle branch pacing as expected could not reduce the QRS to normal values. Uh, there was some residual LBBB even after doing a, a perfect left bundle branch pacing. So you have to put one additional lead in the CS. You can see the CS lead pacing alone. Though the QRS looks narrow, it is not good. But when we club both these together, both this LB pacing as well as LB pacing, we could get a almost normal appearing QRS. Though the LB was 80 millimeters, so this QRS definitely predicts that this person will respond to this sort of optimized CRT therapy. So not only this LB plus CS lead combination, you can use LB plus RV septal lead combination or even LB lead plus CS lead plus RV defib lead if you're going to use a DF1 coil. Regarding the follow-up, yeah, we have a lot of data on follow-up these days. Uh, we have almost three years follow-up available now. This is our one-year follow-up, which was published last year. We could show that both the threshold and RV remain stable, unlike our uh, isbundle pacing, where you can see at least 10 to 20% of the patients demonstrating rising threshold. Here, you're going to have a stable threshold, and lead dislodgements are going to be much, much less. So even in patients with uh, uh, elderly population, like uh, uh, after generations, which we've which we shown that uh, though the numbers are less, so even in octogenarians, octogenarians is going to be a good strategy. It's not going to produce any complications, even in elderly population. Back to our patients, this was an ECG after a month where you can see that the memory TVS, which were there, now got normalized. And the QRS is still the same, around 96 milliseconds. Still, there is an elephant capture with a QR pattern. And uh, what another surprising thing which we observed was within 10 days, we could show significant improvement in LV ejection fraction. So this echo was done on 2nd September and this was done on 12th September. You can see the baseline echo before procedure showing a global hypochalasia. Here you can see a brisk contraction of the left ventricle. And even there was a significant reduction in a mitral regurgitation after the procedure. Just within 10 days, you could see uh, an MR of almost 2 to 3 plus has come down to 1 plus. So this is the thing which we observe in physiological pacing, a rapid response. And uh, almost always, uh, if it is a purely LBB related cardiomyopathy, you'll have a normalization of LV function with a simple dual chamber pacemaker by capturing the left bundle in a period of three to six months. So this we observed in our uh, uh, bicenter study where we gathered data of all CRT patients who had undergone uh, uh, for CRT between 200, 2018 to 2020. We had around 159 patients out of which uh, 84 had an LBB morphology. And among those 84, we had serial ECG follow-up for 17 patients where the LBBB at the time of diagnosis had a normal LV function. Over a period of uh, almost three to four years, they had a worsening of LV function and they had undergone CRT between uh, 2018 to 2020. So among the 17, 13 had undergone level branch pacing and four had undergone uh, other modality, one is and three by pacing. They were taken these 13 patients and what we could show was uh, there was a 34% reduction in QRS and all patients, all the 13 patients had a normalization of LV function by the end of three to six months. So this again confirms that if it is a purely electrical problem in a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, it, it can be a LBBB induced cardiomyopathy or even an LBBB associated cardiomyopathy. If it is a pure electrical problem, and if there is no ischemia, definitely a level branch pacing or even a Hisbund branch, Hisbund pacing is going to have a good response, probably much, much better than cardiac recent conditions therapy. But for saying that it is better than CRT, we need to have a lot of randomized control trial to confirm its superiority over CRT. But 
we know that it is a it's a it's a procedure relatively new procedure the first procedure was done in 2017 by dr one so we had just three years data available now still we need a long-term data to confirm or to probably make it as a default strategy for all pacing purposes and this lead was actually not meant for a, a deep septal pacing so we need to uh, have uh, data on the safety of this uh, myocardial contraction on the lead, whether the insulation failure will occur or not. For this, we have to wait and watch for the long-term data. And another important thing is potential complications. Since you are screwing the lead inside the septum, it can injure the coronary artery. Even we had a case of a trans transient uh, STEMI, which occurred during the procedure, or even where there may be a late lead dislodgement into the LV or into the right ventricular cavity. And since the lead is exposed into the, uh, into the LV cavity, there is a chance that the thrombus may get caught and it can get embolized into the system itself. So all these potential complications, you have to keep in mind while performing this level match pacing. Of course, since it is a relatively new procedure, and since there is a less chance for extracting the lead as the lead is quite stable, the data on lead extraction is still awaited. Another important thing which often arises while discussing about the level match pacing is the potential myocardial injury. So you are screwing the lead inside the septum, you are going to go for at least three or four attempts. So what will happen to the cardiac troponin levels? This is a, it's this is a hard discussion which happens whenever we discuss about this level match pacing. So in fact, we have analyzed the troponin release after level match pacing, after hismal pacing, and after all the other interventional electrophysiological procedure. One interesting thing which could observe was the ismonal produces least amount of my, my troponin positivity and LBBP almost 49% of the patient had a troponin positivity, but it is less than those patients who are undergoing ablations for a simple AVNRT. So the troponin release in patients with a level match pacing is much, much less as compared to those patients who are undergoing an RF ablation for AVNRT. And uh, uh, probably it's expected that patients with an atrial fibrillation will have 100% positivity. So it is a relatively safe procedure in terms of cardiac troponin release. So the search for alternative site to, uh, to uh, RV pacing has been like uh, solved by this physiological pacing. So we have two modalities of physiological pacing. One is Ismundle and another one is Lev bundle. Though Ismundle provides the most physiological form of activation, but still it is fraught with a lot of limitations, which has been clearly addressed by the Lev bundle match pacing. But the only thing is that the long-term safety data is not available so far for Lev bundle match pacing. The longest data is from Dr. Wong's group, which was published in last month's circulation. It's just a three-year data. So we need to wait for some more time to make it as a default strategy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shanmuga. That was an excellent presentation. So what is your uh, choice? Obviously, you prefer lab bundle pacing to his bundle pacing. But uh, uh, if you are to compare the long-term results, Obviously, we don't have uh, too much of long-term results with lap under pacing. And there is a concern about, as you mentioned, the lead about, because it's a repurposed lead, uh, same lead that we use for his bundle pacing. So what is your recommendation? Uh, right? Which of the, them should be preferred, his bundle versus lap bundle? Yes, uh, uh, it's ideally, uh, we have to start with the his bundle pacing. And uh, uh, if the threshold, capture threshold is more than one point, right? previously, before the advent of uh, lap bundle pacing, the accepted threshold limit was 2.5, but now with the availability of lepmanal branch pacing, ideally one should begin with his bundle pacing. And if the correction threshold, if, if the capture threshold is uh, less than 1.5, then probably we can accept his bundle pacing and we can just leave the lead there itself. But if the threshold is more than 1.5, or if you are doing a LBBB correction or an RBBB correction, if the correction threshold of uh, LBBB or RBBB is uh, more than 1.5, then probably we may have to go down to the left bundle. So otherwise, I think the ideal strategy still is to go into the his bundle to look for a look for an optimal response. If only the optimal parameters are not available from the his bundle pacing, then probably we can go down to the left bundle. Thank, Thank you. you. Professor Chen, any comments? No, I don't have any comment about this. Yeah. Thank no you. more comment. So can we move to the next topic, uh, which is inappropriate SICD shocks for bradycardia? Dr. Kumar, is there any other question in the chat box? Uh, no, nothing really. I think we can move at all, something we can come back in the end. Yes, yeah, certainly. So we can move to the next topic, which is on subcutaneous ICD, inappropriate SICD shocks for in a patient with bradycardia. And uh, I invite Dr. Kelvin Chua to, to uh, take up this topic. Dr. Kelvin. 
Dr. Kelvin is an electrophysiologist at National Heart Center, Singapore. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, APHRS, for the invitation. And thank you, Kuma, as well. I thank you for the opportunity to speak in such a forum. Those were uh, two very fascinating talks. I was uh, very impressed with the cases. So uh, um, I'm honored to be able to speak in this uh, uh, forum today. So today I'm, I'll be uh, uh, touching on um, inappropriate SICD shocks for bradycardia. There's uh, a lot of a swing of gear, swing of gears to talk about the uh, SICDs. So I receive honorarium from various companies for talks, none of which are relevant. In today's talk, I'll be doing a, a case presentation. I'll be discussing on the SICD algorithms that make this device unique and different from the conventional transvenous ICDs. I'll have some discussion points and key learning points at the end of the talk. So quickly, I'm going to uh, 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 present to you a 58 years old female with a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and stage renal failure on hemodialysis via a left arterial venous fistula. Uh, she has extensive peripheral vascular disease with bilateral uh, below knee amputation, non ischemic cardiomyopathy, poor EF of uh, uh, 30 to 35 percent, with a subcutaneous ICD implanted since 2014. Of course, in this uh, group of patients, there's always a discussion about the use of SICD versus a transvenous ICD. And uh, some patients with the uh, AVF may still have the option of implanting on the contralateral side. Um, Dr. Cho, sorry to interrupt. I think you yes. can go to the full screen mode on your presentation. I think Probably right not. now it's, yeah, it's, I think it's still on the presentation mode. Hang on, yeah. You can just make it full screen. It's not full screen. Is it full screen now? Yeah, it's better now. Yes, please go ahead. I see. So she reported of shocks from the device. And I'll quickly move on uh, to some of the device uh, uh, tracings that we have. This is a previous SICD check that was done a month uh, before her current admission. You can see that this is a 10 10 uh, device, which is actually a first generation SICD. Um, uh, there's a conditional zone program at 200 and shock zone at 220. Uh, the, 1010 device does not have a smart pass available and you can see that there's one uh, lifetime shocks uh, delivered and this corresponds to the time uh, uh, where the patient at doing the implant and there was a defibrillation testing. And these are the uh, usual, usual parameters we get from the SICD check. There's a primary, secondary and alternate uh, vectors and you can see that actually on the primary vector, which the device uh, chose to be uh, the, the, the main sensing vector, has a good ratio of QRS to, to, to T wave. And uh, you can appreciate why uh, the device uh, chose this parameter. The latest SICD uh, uh, device check now shows that there were four treated episodes with a total of five shocks delivered. All the other settings remain the same, the sensing uh, configuration remains as primary vector. So my first question, I don't know whether we have time, Kuma, and if we have time, maybe you can poll the audience. So what does this uh, tracing show? Is it number one, a shock for VF, a shock for AF, a shock due to T wave oversensing or a shock due to QRS double counting? If the forum allows, maybe we take 30 seconds, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, for 15, 20 seconds, hopefully we'll get some responses. Okay, I think you can see the responses now. Yeah, so very good. So there's about 38% uh, um, who chose um, a shock due to T wave oversensing. And there's also 33% uh, who, uh, who say this was a shock due to QRS double counting. So I'm gonna run through some of the episodes before I, uh, I run through the answers for that question. So this is uh, uh, episode number one. You can see that initially um, what looked like normal rhythm and actually initially on the first six seconds, the first two beats actually showed a broad complex beat, two of them. 
and this also happened in from the 18 second mark as well and by the look of it this is probably a ventricular topic we call a pvc and by the 24 second mark you see that this pvc actually triggered a broad complex tachycardia and this is rather slow if you count the, the timing this is probably in the range about 120 to 130 beats per minute broad complex tachycardia and moving on along the episode you can see that there may be subtle undulations which may uh, 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 correspond to uh, AV dissociation and I would call this uh, broad complex tachycardia likely to be a slow VT and the device appropriately detected this and delivered a shock to it. And the key to this uh, uh, strip is why did the device detect it even, even though this was uh, just 130 bits per minute, per minute. And this was actually due to uh, uh, several areas of double counting. And you can see that this double counting, uh, even sometimes triple counting of each QRSs and that led uh, uh, to detection. So even though uh, uh, this was actually a double counting, but it led to kind of an appropriate and effective uh, shock, even though that this VT was way below uh, the detection uh, zone. So question number two is, uh, why did the device continue to count until the tachycardia detection was satisfied? And you can see on this uh, uh, SICD strip that there was kind of long pauses. So my question is, Shouldn't the, should, shouldn't the device have stopped counting and stopped uh, tachy detection? So why did the device continue to count until tachy detection was satisfied and delivered the shock? Was this due to TF oversensing, QRS double counting, under sensing, or discarded sense beats between long intervals? Great, so uh, a majority of 58% chose uh, the discarded sense beats between long intervals, which is actually the correct answer. So looking at the second episode, again, we see this broad complex beats, and this was already seen in the first episode. And this, we already correctly identify them as likely to be a ventricular escape beats like a PVCs. And this were ventricular escape beats with long pauses in between. And you can see that this uh, uh, ventricular beats actually were sensed at several areas in the QRS, maybe two parts of the QRS and maybe the T wave as well. And at some point, maybe even uh, 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 either a triple counting of the QRS or double counting of the T wave. This one I'm not entirely sure, but in any sense, one QRS complex was counted as four times in the SICD and sometimes even five to six times. And this uh, led to, of course, a uh, 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 tachy tachycardia detection. And the main reason of bringing this talk up is that the SICD actually, uh, 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 because of its subcutaneous nature and the, the possibility of undersensing uh, 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 intracardiac signals, sometimes long pauses with sense intervals are discarded and they continue to count following long pauses. And that is why after a long pause, the device continues to detect tachycardia up to a point where detection criteria is satisfied and device charges up and delivers shocks. So in this lady, she actually missed her dialysis because uh, no family member was around to bring up her dialysis that day. On admission, the potassium was very high at 9.7 with metabolic acidosis. She underwent urgent dialysis and uh, uh, no further events were seen. So um, through this talk, and maybe I'll just uh, point out a little bit about uh, SICD algorithm where uh, uh, there's actually uh, uh, many, many different uh, 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 ways or uh, algorithms that the SICD uses to determine whether tachycardia should be treated or not. And um, think about it as a, a, a hybrid between a surface ECG and an intracardiac uh, 
uh, uh, EGM that we see on transvenous uh, 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 devices. And the ICICD is like almost like a hybrid system between the two. And it uses uh, uh, four double detection algorithms to reduce oversensing and maybe three rhythm discriminators to determine if they should uh, deliver uh, therapies. And this is uh, the arrhythmia classification. And whenever a heart rate is within the, the shock zone, uh, that will be the beat will be labeled as a tachycardia. And if not, even if it's with a conditional zone and they will detect on the morphology through a few algorithms that mentioned from the previous slide, and they will detect whether it is a techie beat or a sense beat by comparing the uh, a benchmark template. And there's also a decision phase to it. And the SICD takes several decision steps to confirm the need for shock. And there's also X over Y criteria, which I'll touch on in the next slide. And there's also charge confirmation, which determines that the rhythm has persisted before uh, 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 delivering the shock. So X over Y gives us a counter and criteria that is used to make initial measure of the nature and detected arrhythmia. The smart charge uh, uh, the extends detection time when the patient has a history of non-sustained arrhythmias. The analysis is performed prior to charging, the capacitors verifying the arrhythmia that's been sustained before delivering the shock. And when uh, confirmation is met, the shock is delivered synchronous with the next detection. So this X over Y criteria, as you mentioned, uh, for the SICD, the nominal uh, uh, um, settings is 18 out of 24, which means that this is a running uh, rolling window, like uh, almost we think about some of our uh, uh, um, transvenous uh, algorithms. There's a rolling window of 24 bits and out of this 24 bits, if 18 of them uh, satisfy techy criteria by in terms of uh, uh, intervals, this will be uh, uh, satisfying the techy detection. And after delivering uh, therapies, this is a redetection criteria, 14 out of 24. The shock confirmation also confirms that a fast rhythm is still present uh, following the capacitor charge completion. And it looks at uh, uh, three fast intervals. And if spontaneous termination is noted, the fast interval requirement is dynamically adjusted upon detections during the charging sequence. So this is the main bulk of uh, 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 this presentation today is that the SICD does not certify any sense beat that is less than 30 beats per minute or being more than two seconds interval apart. The first sense beat following a pause would still be labeled with an S, just like a certified beat would be. However, it will not be used to calculate the four RR intervals that contribute to tachycardia detection. So I'll, I'll use my next slide to make some illustrations. This was the episode two, which I showed you earlier. So if you uh, focus your attention to this long pause in between and uh, the, the, the area, the, the line that is marked with the X, X -trix and the dotted line, this is the first sense beat following a long pause. This beat is actually discarded, but actually there was already taking detection before this. And between the X -trix and the hash tag here, the interval is short. So this is considered a techie beat. And this is still short. This is also considered a techie beat. And this all contributes, continue to contribute to techie detection. And again, this happens uh, uh, many uh, after this long pause again, the first sense beat is discarded techie techie sense because of the longer interval. And sometimes there is a, a quadruple counting of the QRSs. And after, uh, uh, um, after charging, excuse me, after charging, uh, this two plus sign shows that uh, uh, there is confirmation of the rhythm persistence by showing uh, still the techy, the techy intervals are still short, and that uh, uh, there's been the shock is delivered. So the clinical points for this case is. Uh, the first episode, we showed you that there was a, a slow VT. There was double and triple counting of the QRS, leading to tachycardia detection and delivery of shock. So even though this was a slow VT, 
the device uh, detected tachycardia and delivered a shock. The second episode was a ventricular escape rhythm. There was double and triple counting of the QRS, which led to tachycardia detection and delivery of shock. Ventricular pauses and synecdoche bradycardia did not reset the tachycardias and due to a unique SICD algorithm, which I've just touched on, and all these arrhythmias were likely to be provoked by hyperkalemia and acidosis with an underlying non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and end-stage renal failure patient. So with regards to uh, earlier mentioned as a first generation 1010 uh, device, SICD, that did not have smart pass algorithm, but actually, if you think about it, a smart pass algorithm would not have helped. The smart pass algorithm is designed to reduce non-QRS signals, and it would also have been disabled due to long intervals uh, between sense beats. This is also part of the SICD's algorithm uh, 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 when to reduce the chance where under sensing may lead to uh, 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 inappropriate lack of detection of uh, important arrhythmic events. And also uh, the conditional zone programming would not have helped. And this was a very slow uh, uh, VT, even if you have programmed it uh, lower in any sense, uh, it will not have captured it. And the episode two, there was double counting, triple counting of it anyway, and it would have been a uh, well in the shock zone rather than in the conditional zone. So some of the programmable uh, as you know, the SICD, there's very limited options with programming, and even some of the programmable options would not have been able to help. So the key learning points uh, uh, in this case was uh, profound radicardias and oversensing can lead to tachycardia detection and inappropriate shocks, even in contemporary SICDs, not just in the first generation ones. With that, I thank you for your attention and I uh, welcome any questions. I will kind of stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelvin. I think oversensing has always been a problem with the subcutaneous ICDs. And although the incidence has decreased in the, in the third generation, particularly with the smart, the smart pass filter, in the untouched trial, the incidence of inappropriate shock was very low around uh, 3% or in fact 2.6% with this smart pass filter. But that is uh, one problem that because of the very wide sensing vector of these devices, they do have this problem. The QRS complex appeared to be a bit wide in, in your case. Is that right? Uh, the, the double counting QRS example. Say that, say that again, sorry. Uh, the QRS complex duration was wide in that patient where we had double counting of QRS Yes, I, I think it was interesting because when the, when the first patient presented, I mean, the patient already had four shocks, but uh, I should have shown you the ECG. The ECG was normal QRS, but it was actually a very delayed uh, QRS in the terminal uh, uh, depolarization part, such that the QRS was actually hovering about 125 or 130. But the morphology of the QRS was very special. We look exactly at the same sinus QRS, just a little bit broader. And the sinus after... Uh, correction of the, all the electrolytes actually went back to about 95 milliseconds QRS. Yeah. So that is one point. When, when we uh, see the QRS duration, uh, borderline QRS duration or wide QRS duration, these are the patients where we uh, should uh, probably avoid subcutaneous ICD because they might require a really synchronization therapy subsequently where it becomes difficult to upgrade this device to, to CRT. Yeah, it's also difficult to predict for some of these patients, especially the dialysis patient, when you have some electrolyte abnormalities, you never know when the QRS is going to broaden. Yeah. Any questions in the chat box, uh, Dr. Kumar? Um, I think not uh, with regard to the uh, uh, current case. I think there is a couple with regard to the previous one. But uh, before that, um, Kelvin, just to uh, ask you, in such situations where we where you think the oversensing is more likely, maybe because of the little broader QRS, uh, what would be the approach to future management of this uh, patient? Are they going to need to be shifted to a conventional ICD or what needs to be done to prevent this? Yeah, certainly um, looking at the case in overall, we would say that maybe this patient would have only developed this broad complex beat in times of electrolyte disturbances. So of course, uh, we would say that um, the, the device is still 
appropriate, but in that sense, the patient would have to be very religious uh, with not missing her dialysis. And of course, the, the contrary is also true. Let's say if we have a, a, a brand new patient planning for SICD implant and we detect that there was some broadened QRS uh, at the time of some electrolyte abnormalities, maybe these patients should not be offered an SICD. That's my approach. Also, the issue where it uh, ignores the uh, long pause in the SICD. Now, is that a programmable feature or is that fixed for the SICD? Yeah, unfortunately, many things in the SICD is fixed and this is fixed as well. Okay, you can't get around it by programming. Yeah. Okay. Professor Chen, any comments for this particular SICD case? No, I have a... You need to unmute yourself, sir. No, no, no other comment about this one, yes. And uh, also about the previous cases, uh, uh, if you have some questions or comments, you can go ahead. There was a question from Dr. Shrijit Majumdar. Yeah. Uh, So basically, uh, Dr. Sujit has asked a question whether normalization, this is to Dr. Shanmugasundaram, whether normalization of uh, EF when you do left bundle branch pacing is essentially an indicator that it's uh, purely an uh, electrical issue. Uh, would you be able to see that? Or would you want to do uh, cardiac MRI on all of these patients to look at SCAR? Still in uh, uh, all cardiac myopathies, it's always better to get an MRI whenever it is feasible. So if there is no financial uh, restraints, then I think it's better to get a cardiac MRI. Even in our series, which uh, we have uh, uh, published, so almost eight patients out of the 13 had a cardiac MRI, which showed a normal, uh, no lateral limb enlargement. There was no scar at all in that. So the, again, I reconfirm that there is no other structural component there. It's more of an electrical dysynchrony mediated LV dysfunction. And that all the more uh, favors you to go for uh, only resynchronization without defibrillator. Of course, we know that in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, the role of defibrillator is still a doubtful one. So if you have a double confirmation by doing MRI, there are two ways it's going to help. One is like uh, uh, definitely uh, in the long run, your EF may improve and there is no role of a defibrillator in those cases. And second thing, you'll be able to assess the septal scar also. Suppose if you're planning for left bundle, uh, of course not for his bundle where you'll be targeting the maple septum. In left bundle, I would like to see the septal status, whether it has any scar, whether it is is there any mid myocardial scar, especially because that is the area where we usually get stuck up. The initial two, three turns, it will go and it will get stuck up in the mid myocardial. So in, in, the, in, in those way also, looking for scar, the MRI will help. So I would prefer to get MRI if there is no financial commitment in all the patients. Thank you, uh, Shandra. And uh, uh, Victor, I think there are a couple of uh, um, questions with respect to your topic uh, from the audience. One is the role of ICD in patients whom you have ablated for BT in congenital uh, heart disease. Uh, the second related question is asking whether pulmonary valve replacement in patients with TOF reduces uh, future risk of BT. And the third question is the, what kind of medical therapy would you put uh, these patients on after your ablation? So three related questions. Okay. So the, uh, this case of VT ablation in a fellow patient is a, a very recent case. Uh, we performed it maybe uh, two or three weeks ago. Um, it was a case of um, this patient had a clinical VT, okay? Um, not so well tolerated, but uh, without uh, syncope. Um, and so um, our endpoint was very good with uh, very aggressive uh, ventricular stimulation and no, uh, and, and no other arrhythmia induced. So we decided not to put an ICD, um, but uh, we already plan uh, another ventricular stimulation in three months to be sure uh, of the known uh, inducibility um, uh, in, a, in a couple of months. It's not a, a, a so a simple question, but I think in very selected patients, um, we follow because the uh, patient we follow, the ventricular arrhythmia um, um, are often uh, located in the same location. But so my, my answer will be um, in other uh, congenital heart disease, I will put an ICD for sure. Okay, but in patient we follow, 
if the endpoint is uh, very good, okay, and if you end this no other IPR, you 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 can um, um, you can not to put an ICD, but you have to be uh, to be uh, very sure of it. And if the patient um, had have have had a syncopy with this VT, maybe I will uh, add uh, I would have put an ICD. Uh, for the question on the effect on pulmonary valve replacement uh, on VT, we uh, study a French registry, the day 84 registry, which collects all patients with ICD and follow in France. And we worked on this uh, subject very recently. The, the paper will be published uh, in less of uh, one month in Jack EP. And it's not a simple question because it's only observational data but we uh, demonstrated that after PVR, when we compared the same patients before and after PVR with an ICD, so with a continuous monitoring of ventricular apneas, the burden uh, decreased, okay? Uh, some patients um, had um, ICD therapies, but uh, um, far less commonly than before the, uh, the ICD. So, Hemodynamic, hemodynamic optimization reduces the burden of, of ventricular tachycardia. And the last question was uh, pharmacological therapy, I think. So in this patient, we um, only um, uh, introduce uh, beta blocker therapy, okay, because the patient was quite uh, young, so we didn't, we don't want to to put it uh, to put him under amiodarone for uh, uh, for years. So that's it. We only uh, introduced uh, beta blockers, and we are going to control the ventricular stimulation in a few in a few months. Excellent. I think uh, that uh, answers the uh, questions um, very well. Any other questions or comments from the chairpersons? No, thank you. I think uh, we've had a very good discussion and I really thank all the speakers. They've done a commendable job. And thank you, Kumar, for organizing this uh, so wonderfully. Thank you, sir. So I think uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we will uh, conclude this uh, webinar. I once again, on behalf of the APHRS Young EP uh, subcommittee, I thank all the three speakers, Victor Waldman, Kelvin Chua, and uh, Shanmugh Sundaram for taking their time and sharing their uh, expertise and nice teaching points with us. And I thank both the chairpersons, Dr. Anil Saxena and Professor Xian Chen for again guiding us so nicely through this, uh, these topics. And I hope the uh, audience gained from all these three wonderful cases. So uh, thank you and I wish everyone uh, a great day and a good weekend. Thank you. <laughs>